Hello, everyone. I'm Cheryl Stenstrom, as uh, Sue just mentioned, and along with Dr. Allman, um, we chair the Library and Management uh, Advisory Committee at the San Jose State uh, University Schools of, School of Information. We have a variety of advisory committees that um, help us work through different, different subject areas and different uh, topics, and um, our committee on uh, leadership and management uh, has asked us uh, over the past while, but particularly in the last year to uh, help uh, prospective students and some of the newer students and continuing students uh, talk about and see what it's like to have a management position within a library and information science organization. And so in response, uh, we've developed this four part series with a variety of different speakers um, uh, and uh, different presentation styles to talk about their experiences, um, current and past, or, or however um, works best for them, in terms of what it's like to really be a leader or a manager in a library or uh, information organization. Uh, we collaborated as well with the uh, San Jose State University Career Center. We want to give a special thanks to Kim Doherty and Jill Cleese. And today, um, we are very, very pleased to welcome Dr. Tracy Elliott from the uh, uh, San Jose State University King Library. She is the dean there and has been there since uh, 2016, June 2016. So you're, it sounds like you're getting close to an anniversary, Tracy. Um, and uh, has really uh, extensive experience in higher education management, more than 20 years. Before uh, becoming the dean at SJSU, she was the director of libraries at the State College of Florida. She was the head librarian at St. Petersburg College and the dean of Le learning resources at, I'm sorry, I can't say the name of the community college in Virginia you worked <laughs> at. You might want to tell us that. Um, it's Rappahannock. So, Rappahannock, thank you. <laughs> uh, she holds a PhD in leadership and education from Barry University, which is also in Florida and a master in library and information studies, as well as a bachelor's in communication from Florida State. So um, living a bit of a long way from home in California. Uh, so again, thank you for joining us today, Tracy. We're thrilled that you could. Um, and uh, you and I are gonna do a bit of an interview style presentation today. Uh, I've got some questions prepared and we'll work through until um, uh, we've, you know, 45 or 50 minutes into the presentation and leave a bit of time at the end for questions. Um, I'll ask you quickly though, are you comfortable if people have questions and they put them in the chat or raise their hand, are you happy to answer those as you go or would you prefer to leave everything to the end? Uh, we can, we can try as we go. Okay. All right. Great. So um, I think uh, unless you have comments before we start, we'll get started. Yeah, I think we go ahead and get started. All right, great. So the questions that we prepared, um, again, in conjunction with the Career Center, because they know what students really want to know for leadership positions. Um, and the first one is, before you were in a leadership role, did you have hesitations about moving into this level of responsibility? And how did you handle that? Yeah, no, I had no hesitations. Um, I'm not really sure why that is. I probably should have, but I, I never did. Um, so I can't really say how I handled it. I, um, in most cases, the uh, leadership roles that I've had, I've jumped in head first and probably should have done a little bit more thinking before I took them, but, um, but they all worked out pretty well. So, but for me, I, I definitely learned a lot. Um, then the most surprising thing about leadership was learning how being humble and admitting your mistakes is essential in building trust uh, among your associates. You can be infallible, it's okay. In fact, when you are, um, it's a tremendous opportunity for team building. You need to own your mistakes and enlist others to move the organization forward. Um, and, and also, the other thing that I've learned is that uh, those are your biggest cheerleaders when you start a new position uh, will most likely be the ones you will disappoint the most in the long run. Whereas the most skeptical people uh, of your, who are skeptical of your abilities as a leader will potentially be your staunchest supporters once you prove, your, prove yourself. So those were two surprises for me. I bet, I bet. And we've got a question here in the chat that's really relevant. Um, Samantha's asking, what made you feel confident about taking on those roles? You know, why, 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 why do you think there wasn't any hesitation? 
I think that's just something I've always done. Um, I don't want to say that I was like the the um, play school or uh, playground bully, but I was also the, I was always the one to say, "Hey, come on, let's do this or let's try this." Um, I my mom used to laugh at me because I used to you know bark orders at my my dolls and my stuffed animals. <laughs> <laughs> I was always I was always in charge. So I think I've always just sort of levitated to wanted wanting to be the one to lead. And so I think that I've never really shied away from those opportunities. I was always student government president. I was always the, you know, the the chair of things. I was even in my daughter's school, I was the PTA president. It's just for me, I, I end up taking on that role even with subconsciously, I think. So Great, thank you for being so um, open about, uh, uh, I guess, your personality and your uh, desires. The next question we have is related, but I'm wondering if you haven't answered it. Sue, if you can move to the next slide. Um, we just wanted to ask why you uh, wanted to seek out leadership roles. Uh, so is there anything that you have to add um, other than it sounds like a natural predisposition to wanting to be in that kind of position? Yeah, I think that's what it is. I, you know, obviously you want to be in the position in which you can be most effective. And there have been times where being the leader of a team, I re recognized that I was not the one that should be the leader and that I needed to be more of a follower and more of a take up more of a back role and, and, and play to my strengths in, in a particular situation. But, um, for the most part, I feel that as a leader, I can be much more effective in um, moving the library forward and moving any organization that I've worked for uh, forward and for to help it be successful. Um, I have another question in the chat and I'm, I will ask you a bit about challenges later, but I think this one is a, isn't really covered in our prepared questions. Um, and it's around being a woman in leadership. So wondering if you found that you had any specific challenges related to that. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, you, you have to be honest about that. Um, I have definitely been in very uncomfortable situations where um, inappropriate things have been said to me by um, male leaders and, and even in some case uh, or other male leaders uh, and, and people in higher positions than I am and, but in not just men either and women as well, where, uh, you're put into categories or it's just assumed that you're being over emotional or a sort of a, a response to a situation that if I was a man behaving in that way or acting in that way, there was there there would be no no conversation about you're being too emotional or you're not you're being irrational and and that's difficult and what you do have to do is compartmentalize that and and not attack the person that's doing that but really try to help reframe reframe this reframe the situation so that uh, you can both see things differently and you can have a conversation moving forward and. And it, it is definitely challenging. I, I'm not, I'm sure that men have their own challenges, but as a woman, there is a lot of that. There's a lot of stereotyping. Um, there's a lot of um, expectations of what you can and can't do. And, and I've had to, I've had to work over those hurdles over and over again. And and it was interesting because when I, I, most of my work has been in the southeastern United States. So you expect, you know, a certain amount of misogyny in the south. And I had, was completely blindsided when I moved to California and found it was actually worse here. So I was really expecting it to be, and in many ways, California is so progressive. But there is definitely uh, a, a definite, and especially in Silicon Valley, I, I understand it's much worse in this area. Um, I was just blindsided by what what I was experiencing really within the first few months of me getting here. So that has been really, really challenging. But nothing you can't handle and nothing you can't overcome by showing um, how effective you are as a leader. 
Right, always that um, uh, the, the standards, right, of uh, good leadership is good leadership and no matter who it is, for sure. Yeah. Um, Sue's put a question in our chat here, and uh, again, um, we don't quite cover it in our further questions, so I'd like to ask you now, and it is a bit related a little bit to what you said, sort of your own personality growing up. Um, and so for those, when you've got, you have employees who are looking to uh, develop their leadership skills or just um, you know, as you're supervising or managing or leading your own employees, are there ways that you help them to be leaders as well? Specific things that you can think of in that sense? Absolutely. Um, I think there are some some questions about that, kind of kind of about that uh, coming up. But um, I believe that it's my responsibility as a leader to ensure that everyone in the organization has an opportunity to lead and. And really, I, as the dean of this library, I am, my expectation is that everyone who comes here is a leader in some way. And particularly if you're a librarian, you have more of a responsibility to do that because you are the expert in the field. And the expectation is that you will bring something to this library that no one else is able to do. And so you have to be able to lead. So I believe in um, the, the investment in professional development for employees, I believe in mentoring, I make, I really applaud and cultivate those middle managers who also look and provide opportunities for leadership for those who report to them. There are so many ways that, that you can help cultivate leaders within your organization and really it's your responsibility as a leader to do that. Okay, good. So on the other side, um, uh, how would you define a successful leader? So when you're mentoring them or for yourself, and um, what about the influences that you've had uh, as leaders? Um, how has, has that been affected by the leaders under whom you've worked? Well, I believe that a successful leader is someone who can help others achieve their potential, even when they themselves don't even recognize that potential within themselves. Um, and I think that the measure of a successful leader is the satisfaction of the, the associates. So those that follow you or those who uh, report to you or are within your organization, um, their satisfaction on having completed a job well done. Uh, we are always celebrating in this library because I think we're doing amazing things every day. So it seems like every day there's a, a reason for us to celebrate and to be patting each other on the back and just say, stepping back and saying, oh my goodness, we just did that. We just did that amazing thing. We are the first ones to do it or we're the leaders in the CSU or uh, which is the California State University system um, or the leaders in the country on something. So it, it the leader is really the measure of a good leader is the satisfaction of those that they lead and and they feel that they feel pride in their work they feel like they make a difference and i think if i can you can't look at me and say look at you know just what the library has accomplished you need to ask the employees of the library are they satisfied or do they feel like they're making a difference that and if they say yes, then then I'm a successful leader. Oh, and then leaders that I worked for. So leaders I worked for, um, they believed in me even when they didn't understand <laughs> what my vision was. Even if they didn't have the same vision, they were willing to take the risk. They were willing to allow me to push the envelope on things. And, and a lot of times as a library, I've been a library director and dean for the majority of my career as a librarian and I work my supervisors have been provosts and vice presidents and most of the time they don't understand the library speak they don't understand um, information science uh, they just know when people are happy and when people are satisfied with with uh, the work that you do and so a lot of times it does take them really believing in me and giving me lots of autonomy. And so I think that I try to replicate that as much as I can as a leader, because I need to give people the space to be able to be uh, experimental and to take risks. And 
I've had lots of feedback from um, employees who have said that that's what they appreciate uh, the most about me is the willingness to, to try something new and be it's okay if we fail at it um, as long as we learn something from it. Great. Um, I think uh, Sue and I both want to circle back, back to, you know, you were just mentioning the first part of that question um, when you're talking about uh, developing leader, you know, showing um, leadership style and working with your employees and how everyone in the King Library uh, takes on a leadership role. And uh, she's asking, what ways do you recognize those accomplishments? And further, what are some of the accomplishments that uh, have happened in the King Library since you've arrived? Well, one of the things we did, <laughs> for those of you who truly understand or have worked in uh, libraries for a while or um, have used extensively used libraries, we moved from a uh, server-based library management system or integrated library system uh, to a uh, cloud-based, but we went from a, a shared system with the public library here at um, San Jose to a shared system among all of the CSUs, which is 23 different institutions. And we, we went to Alma, we went from Sierra to Alma, and that was quite an undertaking. And there was very little support at the central office. So we have the chancellor's office, for those of you who, we are a system of 23 institutions. We do have a centralized office that provides some support to the library, but there was very limited um, amount of support that came out of the chancellor's office. So there was a lot of responsibility placed upon the campuses to make sure that this actually happened. And it had to happen for all 23 of us. We couldn't just say, oh, well, we have programmers and we have experts here at San Jose State and, and not help out Channel Islands or not help out um, uh, Chico or Humboldt, the smaller, the smaller college or the smaller universities in our system. So there was a lot of work done um, here at San Jose State to make that happen. And we were recognized by the chancellor's office for that work that we did. Uh, we, we had a party, <laughs> we had a lot of cake. There was a lot of congratulating every opportunity we had. We, we brought those that were responsible, and I'm talking about a lot of people that were leaders in, in, in this area. Uh, we brought them in front of the, the provost. We had him thank them. The, they were recognized in front of the president. Um, at a regular basis, our senior management team would talk about the accomplishments of the individuals and make sure that they were given, um, given you know, adequate, um, I guess, credit <laughs> for, for the work they did. Uh, we had one person in particular that was just a, a game changer, we think, for the CSU in being successful. And we made sure he was rewarded monetarily. So we, do, we, we come up with as many ways as we can to recognize the, the excellence in our employees and, and the leadership that they take. Um, I can go on and on. We, we've done so much. We started the first ever late night tutoring program in a university library in California. Um, and we are responsible for those tutors and it's in, incredibly successful. Uh, we went to 24 hours um, study, five days a week um, for the whole building. So we're the only ones in the CSU that do that. Um, we just added uh, VR and AR lab and we're working with the deans and the faculty across campus to integrate that into assignments. Um, we are opening an incubator in our lower level of our library, which uh, from what we can tell is the first of its kind in the country. So we're doing all kinds of things that are, you know, we don't have anybody that we can turn to and say, hey, how are you doing this? And um, we are very, very proud of that. That's amazing. Um, so if you can go to the next slide, I'd like to ask you about uh, attitudes for successful leaders and I'll add a question to that about style as well. Um, but uh, it sounds like, you know, one of your uh, traits for success is having a lot of energy. So uh, <laughs> in addition to the questions on the slide, which are around uh, the skills that you think help you most in your role and how you develop them, we have another question that fits in with that from our chat board, which is, 
how would you describe your leadership style? So if you could address a kind of uh, skills and styles. Yeah, I think, uh, you know what they say, once you get a PhD, you realize how little you know, and my PhD is in leadership. And so there's an enormous amount of pressure on somebody who has a PhD in leadership to be able to describe their leadership style. It's like, oh gosh, where do I be begin? Read my dissertation. <laughs> You know, so it, that's a hard one, but there's certainly some traits that I recognize that are really important for me. And I think that are things that I have to remember on a regular basis to make sure that I emulate. Um, the first is to, to serve as the role model. You have to walk the walk. If you are not the biggest cheerleader for your organization, then uh, you're not, you're not going to be successful. You don't deserve to lead that organization. So, and I, I did this, I, I think when I, I first started to walk the walk as a, a library director, and really it wasn't as a director, it was as my first library position, my librarian position at Columbus State University, I, I made sure that I led small projects that had the potential for big impact. And I had the support of my library director at the time and, and my supervisor. And the impact was throughout campus and people started talking about the library and what librarians could do for student success, how students could get better grades, how they could um, how they could save time in their studies by talking with a librarian and how they did better on tests by uh, developing assignments that required library uh, library resources be included in those assignments. Um, so, so that's important is walking the walk and, and really taking the opportunities that you have to, to create projects that will have a good, a large impact and um, create advocacy for your library. Uh, the, the second one is um, providing inspiration. We need to know as, as librarians and as directors and deans, um, that we have to constantly be telling the story of the impact that we do have on the institution, on faculty research, on student research, or on your community, on your, um, your organization that you're, you're in, regardless if it's a public library, university library, or an information organization. You constantly need to understand and um, talk about what it is that you do and why you're important and and helping other people feel inspired by that so the people who work within the organization for them to be able to do the same thing for them to know immediately why what they do is important and I think the third thing for me is that you have to concern have concern for each individual in the library you have to know what their strengths are and and you need to help them realize that potential so again, if it's not a library in any organization that you have, you really have to know the people who work there. You have to know what it is that they do. And, and, and sometimes you're able to see potential in them that they don't see in themselves and you need to help them realize that. I mean, that is so, so important. We can't do any of the things that we've done at this library or any of the other libraries I've worked at if people didn't believe in themselves and somebody didn't allow people to do what it is that they do um, well and, and give them, you know, the opportunity to do so. I hope I answered that question. <laughs> you did, thank you. I just um, was just reviewing the question that came to the chat just as you wrapped that up and it's, it's really related. So it, the question is, what, what do you do when you have um, an exemplary employee with a, they have these highly needed skills, but you don't have an official position to offer them at that time? Oh, there's always opportunities for leadership. So we're, we're constantly um, creating new services, we're exploring new projects, and we're, we put together, and, I, and sometimes ad nauseum, we try to come up with different names for committees. We might call them a task force or an advisory group or uh, you know, something different <laughs> than committee. Um, but you can always find opportunities for people to lead. And 
you can appoint them as the chairs of those committees or they can work that out within the committee themselves but um, or you can even just give them a project on their own um, to do some research on something new that the library might be able to do or um, how do we maximize the systems that we have in a different way how do we use um, like SharePoint to help us with scheduling our meeting rooms things like that so you task people with things in within their own capacity and let them lead that project let them be the expert of that project i believe that every single employee in a library has leadership responsibilities and it's all about making sure that they recognize that they are the leader in these different capacities if I could just jump in here a minute, I'm wondering if the question, though, might have been more directed to um, a person who's not in a full-time professional librarian position uh, and there are no librarian positions open. So what do you do if someone is a clerk or um, another member on the staff who seeks to be a full-time librarian uh, has the skill sets, but you don't have that opening? That's really interesting because I actually answered that question with, with the staff in mind, not the librarians. Um, because I really feel like, you're, like you said, librarians are already in those leadership roles. So we actually have 60 staff members or in our library. And um, I think about 15 of them have masters in library science from SJSU. I believe most of them, uh, if not all of them. Um, so there are some of your most, in my opinion, some of your most successful graduates. Um, they, they are in leadership positions. Um, they, we give them opportunities for leadership. And as a matter of fact, while we're speaking, we have some work lead training going on that is being, that was put together by our associate dean. They're literally in, in the training right now as we speak because I was supposed to help her and, and I realized we, we had this conflict. Um, and these are people who are, um, they're not administrators, they're not librarians, and they do have a, a few people that are reporting to them, um, but they are not in an official capacity within the university to uh, make any uh, administrative decisions on behalf of their employees. So it's all about leadership. They're learning how to, to manage one-on-one. -on -one. They're learning what the responsibilities of a leader or a manager is. So they're, they're kind of at the cusp of moving up to a director position or, um, or a coordinator position, but they just don't have that, they don't have that rank yet and they don't have that responsibility. And, and then those that are at the face-to-face uh, -face or at the, I hate to say it, <laughs> so the lowest rank, I suppose, um, in the library uh, um, as far as positions, they are often involved in decision-making um, and particularly within their departments. Uh, our, our managers are always making sure that they're getting input from the individuals and they're tasking them with with projects and goals. So annually they're given goals to accomplish and sometimes they're expected to be the leader of, of a project and that's one of their goals. So there's always opportunities for people. We want to make sure that we're taking advantage or if I want to take advantage, we're maximizing the potential of the people who work for us and making sure that they're also feel very fulfilled in their work. So we have to provide them opportunities to feel like they're contributing. And so there's always that conversation and dialogue between the manager and the employee. And, and then that information is also brought back up to me to make sure that yeah, I'm asking, well, as people are moving on, as things are shifting, as we're reorganizing, who do you think is, would be good in this role? And who do you think would be good in this role? And we have conversations about that all the time. So it's not just about becoming a librarian. For me, some of our most important positions are non-librarian positions um, within the organization to make the organization work. For me, the librarians are the leaders and the outward facingness of the library and some of the, the key work that's done between the faculty and the students. The number one um, 
Im or the, the most impactful thing that the library can do on student success or, or provide for students to be successful is that collaboration between a librarian and a student. My research has shown over and over, and so have many colleagues within the, 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 um, the profession, that it's that one-on-one -on -one collaboration with a student and librarian that has the greatest impact on their success, their, their time to graduation, their GPA, um, their, their opportunities to go into graduate school, et cetera. So all of, out of everything that the library does, the one thing that is most impactful is the librarian collaboration. And in that way, the librarian is always going to be a leader. They're always going to be trying to get people to, to take advantage of, of that collaboration. Great. Um, this, uh, I've got a question in the chat that relates a little bit to the question that we have the, on the slide, as well as uh, we, we talked earlier um, about collaboration between you and the employees, not so much between librarians and students, but that kind of, um, in, uh, you know, having, uh, being informed as you make decisions and working with your staff on some of those decisions. But the question in the chat is around tough decisions. Um, so how do you go about making those tough decisions? And maybe you can address that a bit around, and I think you have already been addressing this uh, question that's on the slide around uh, anything that you want to add around uh, attitudes that you think are important for leaders. And I think I'm, I'm asking those because in my experience, those are uh, tough decisions and attitudes are often related to, but maybe you don't find that so much. Either way, those are the um, <laughs> questions on the table right now, Tracy. Okay, well, um, I think what you do when you make tough decisions is you, you, you make a decision based upon what is best for the users of your organization. So the users of your library and the people who work within the library. So as long as you know that you're putting students and faculty um, and the mission of the university first, as well as those people who are responsible for making, <laughs> making things happen, as long as you're you're putting them first and you're not doing anything to, to, um, to challenge that mission or to make life harder for students or make life harder for faculty or make life harder for your employees, then, and, you've got, and you, you do that to the best of your ability with the information that you have, then you're most likely going to make the right decision. Not everybody would agree with you and some people may see things a little differently, but it's easier if those decisions are challenged. The other thing is that we're always telling everybody it's just books, you know, we're not making life or death decisions here with this is not med school. This is not We can if we make a mistake, we can make up for that mistake. We can we can make things right if we make a decision that is does not go well that doesn't turn out the way that we thought it was going to we can always fix it. And that's what I was saying in the beginning. That's one thing I learned as a leader is that you have to be willing when you make a mistake, when you make a tough decision and it's not the right one or it's not quite right, you can fix it. You just have to own it and you have to enlist the help of others to fix it and to help move the institution forward. That, that is really important. We all make mistakes and it's okay. I mean, that's how we learn and that's how we get better at what we do. You try to minimize those mistakes as much as you can, but uh, you can't be afraid of making tough decisions. You just have to know, you have to know who the most important people are when you make those decisions and you need to protect those people and you need to make sure that they're, you know, that you're not stopping them from being successful. So as far as um, what I think are most important attitudes for leaders, I think it's really, really important that, that you embody the mission and the vision and the values of that organization. And like I said before, if you are not your organization's number one cheerleader, you have absolutely no business being the leader. If you find yourself at home saying, you know, I really don't like that place. I really don't want to go to work today then you need to really rethink <laughs> about where you are. You really should not be there. You, should, you need to be somewhere where you truly believe in what you're doing and what the institution is doing 
um, in order for you to be effective. And, and that's so true. I mean, I, I have to fundraise. I'm asking donors for millions of dollars for the library. And if I don't believe in what we're doing, I have no business asking for that money. I have no business asking for it, but I don't even blink because I know that the investment in this library and in this university is a good one because I truly believe in what I do and what this institution does. And if you can't say that, then you're not going to be a, a successful leader. You also need that same attitude if you want to attract and retain good employees, talented employees. And you need to have that same attitude to get people to buy into the value, to be an advocate for your library. It's so important. That's all I had to say about that. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, we want to uh, shift uh, uh, questions a little bit um, and thinking a bit more about some of our participants today who are either taking the program or thinking about going to library school or maybe are close to graduation and are looking to take on uh, leadership roles in organizations. Um, and Sue, if you can skip forward a little bit, the question is what kind of uh, experience did you have, supervisory experience specifically, before you took on your first leadership role? I know you've been doing this for a long time, but maybe even before you had um, a job in a library or you know some of those transferable skills that you, you help, that helped you take on a uh, leadership role and, and specifically even around supervision. Right. I, I actually held um, two management positions in, um, in the retail industry before I decided that I wanted to get my, my library degree at Florida State. Um, one of them was the manager of a portrait studio, and the other one was uh, assistant manager and that led to a management position at a um, clothing store. And that was really all about supervising. And you know, when you have to sell items and you need people to be at work and you need them to provide good customer service, and that was a that was very that was very helpful for me in my role now. And and what I learned, I did make mistakes. I mean, you're you're going to as a manager. Um, probably the hardest thing I ever did is right out of college, I got a management, like the portrait, I managed a portrait studio, and I had to fire somebody that I hired because um, he was scaring the children <laughs> that he was taking photographs of. He didn't mean to, but he was, uh, it was in Columbus, Georgia, it was a military town, and um, he, he was a sergeant in the army. So, you know, sometimes you just can't turn that off. He was a great photographer, but he just couldn't get children to smile because they were afraid of him. <laughs> So, so I had to fire him and it was really hard because technically he did everything right and he, he showed up, he was the perfect employee, but uh, you know, so you, you, I learned then that you have to take responsibility for putting somebody in a position that should not, I should not have hired him. I should have thought about that um, beforehand and, and you have to think about all of the skills that were required for that particular position and how every position is so key to the success of your organization. He was one of three photographers and one third of the, of the customers he was in front of. And so that was really impactful. The other thing is that when I was in school, I was always um, in, especially in high school, I was always in a role that was responsible for uh, like student government president. I was in charge of event planning. I was in charge of ad advocacy for students, for the, for the school. I was in front of school boards. Um, I had to do public speaking all the time. I did fundraising for, um, for my school and for my class. Um, I did budgeting. I ran meetings. Um, I did strategic planning. Um, so I, I didn't know that I was getting management experience while I was in uh, middle school and high school, but I was. And you always have the opportunity to get, to get that experience. And so um, related to that, uh, our next slide is a, a question again um, about people who are aspiring to leadership roles. What do you think is most important for some of our students to know about leadership? I think what's most important um, is that you need to be prepared to be a leader as soon as you graduate and you get your position. Librarians are considered leaders, even if they're an entry level librarian position. So you will be expected to lead programs, projects, and in many cases, 
um, students right out of grad school are managing people and budgets. Um, and even if you don't have the title of manager or director, you're doing this. So therefore, you need to think seriously right now about what kind of leader you are going to be. The biggest tip I can give you is to remember, it's not about you. It's about the library or the organization that you work for, including the people who use it and the people who work in it. Putting users and employees first is the key to successful leadership. You can't go wrong if you do that. You may fail, but you'll fail honorably and you'll learn enough to be successful soon enough. So don't be afraid. You are going to learn as you go. Um, but just remember and be prepared for the fact that you will be a leader. If you don't see yourself when you get an entry level position as a leader, then you're already setting yourself up for failure. You need to look at how you can lead your organization forward, even at the entry level position. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, you talked about those great examples of, you know, being uh, on committees and, you know, participating in planning, even when you're a kid and you didn't realize it was strategic planning and <laughs> all those things. Do you have advice uh, or ways you could su suggest students practice those skills while they're at, uh, in their program, uh, you know, in terms of specific activities they could take on or um, beyond the job maybe that you think, you know, if you as an employer saw their uh, CV, what would stand out to you then and show you that they've been keen to develop those skills as they're applying for those first jobs? Right. Um, I've, I've often hired people who had no um, official or paid experience um, at, at leading into positions that I knew that they would have to be leaders. Um, because I think that if you, if you are leading so my suggestion is that think of a, a project and apply for grants or other funding for that project. It could be a research project, um, a program at a school, a, a public or academic library. For example, you could offer to raise money for books for your local elementary school. They always need books. <laughs> you know, look at Oklahoma. The teachers are, are saying how they, they teach reading and they don't have any books in their classrooms or in their library. There's always, there's always an opportunity for an organization to need leadership, to need more resources, and you could be that person, or you can join a group that's doing that and take on some of that responsibility. Um, and you can, you, you need to ask help from others. M my suggestion is that you come up with your own project and that you lead it, and then you ask for help from others. Because some of the most accomplished leaders are those who can successfully lead volunteers or um, making something out of nothing. So when I was the PTA president um, at my daughter's high school, I learned how difficult it was <laughs> to get busy parents to want to give their time. I found it very easy for them to write me a check so that they didn't have to participate um, in, in any of the fundraising. But it, it was very challenging. And I, I truly believe that a person who can lead volunteers is a much it has proven that they can do so is to me almost more convincing of a leader than somebody who is able to lead employees who work for them and their paycheck is dependent upon whether or not um, they like them you know so I think that you really have an opportunity in that case to uh, develop into a transformational leader when you're leading a project that's a nonprofit um, and then you don't know what your potential of a leader, what potential you have as a leader until you're in that kind of situation. I learned, and I, I, my daughter graduated five years ago from high school. So I've been a leader all this time, but I swear I learned, and maybe it was because I was going through my PhD at the same time that I was learning about leadership. But I found a lot more of the applicability of studying leadership to that position than my own position of director, director of the library. So. I think that you have a tremendous, you, you, you make your opportunities for leadership and you can do that in so many ways. Your community needs you, it needs your leadership. So you should take advantage of that. 
Um, I, if we have time, I want to uh, go back and sort of ask you about some of those challenges, but I do want to ask you our last prepared question, which is uh, if you've got some titles that you'd recommend or articles that you'd recommend to our participants uh, on leadership, that, uh, especially given your uh, dissertation work, I think you'll have a lot to say about this. And <laughs> I also want to have time to open the floor for questions. So if you've got a couple of titles, that would be great. And then we'll move from there. Yeah, my suggestion are just some easy reads. Um, of course, you can uh, look at the bibliography, my 35 pages of references for my dissertation or whatever it is, and, and look at the leadership or even just the literature review on the history of leadership. Um, and there, you'll find lots of books within that that you can read. But for me, the ones that I find very um, something that you would listen to like when you're commuting to work or or just picking up and just wanting 15 20 minutes to read while you're sitting at the doctor's office or whatever first one is leading change by John Cotter he's a Harvard professor um, I think that that one's really important because the hardest thing to lead is change there are literally people who have phobias against change and being able to move in an organization through a, a difficult transition is essential. And he really gives some really practical, really down to earth advice. And he's a Harvard professor, so I'm assuming, you know, he, he also brings a lot of theory into it, but he really makes it a very practical book. It's a, it's a great book. It's called Leading Change and the author is John Cotter. Uh, there you go. Thank you, Cheryl. <laughs> and the other one, which will probably be surprising to most people is Leadership in the New Science by Margaret Wheatley. I read that book um, in my my leadership my first leadership class in, in my PhD program, and um, and I had to do like a sort of a book review of it to the class, and um, I was really surprised. I thought, oh my gosh, really? I what? I don't know science. I don't. I'm not a scientist. But oh my goodness, it was just it was really amazing. It's really an interesting way of looking at leadership and looking at the way organizations work and um, an organizational culture. I mean, if you're not aware of the impacts of organizational culture on your the output of your of your institution, then you're missing some amazing opportunities. And she does a really good job in helping people look at things differently. There's a lot of YouTube videos um, from Margaret Wheatley as well that um, she talks about when she's in front of um, like GM and she does a lot of consultations with major companies um, and it's all based upon the science, the new sciences like quantum physics and, and that kind of stuff. And so it's, it's really interesting. It's a great re it's a great listen. That's a really good book for audio if you're if you're into audiobooks. Um, it's a lot of fun. She does the reading of it. Um, but it but it's really exciting. And of course then I have my theories, my favorite theories. I have to talk about those real fast. So transformational leadership um, is what my dissertation is on primarily. Um, I think that there's really key uh, my research shows that three of the factors for transformational leadership are extremely, extremely impactful and are predictors of, of success in the organizational learning of an, of an academic library. And um, of course, there's tons of research out there that says it's also impactful in, in most organizations. Um, and then another leadership theory that's really interesting to me is the leader member exchange. It really helps you to think about being honest and being inclusive in your uh, leadership capacity. It's so important to be inclusive. It's so important to think of everyone in the organization and that leader, leader membership member stage or LMX theory is really important. And then finally, one that I use all the time is, and I, it, cause it's so easy to remember, is Kurt Lewin's change theory and it's that freeze unfreeze um, theory about organizational change that is so crazy applicable. I think about it constantly. I even use it in my own life. <laughs> when uh, I don't mind to say I use it, I, I follow the sort of the principles of it and recognize what's happening in my own life when I'm going through change. Um, so those are really cool theories. Are really easy to um, to get your brain around and very helpful. Wonderful, thank you. Um, um, before we uh, uh, get into a little few more in, informal questions, I want to open the floor to our participants to see if there are additional questions that you need, anything burning that you want to type into the chat, or if you want to raise your hand or take the mic.
<laughs> Sounds like you saw the question that's just come in, Casey. How do you avoid taking on too much? I, I should have seen this coming. Right. Um, yeah, that, I think for me, that's the biggest challenge because you do, um, with this new um, incubator that's coming into the library, it's a, we have all of our deans, we have nine deans at the institution, and all of us are working on this project, making sure that it's interdisciplinary, that we're able to scale it across the university eventually. We're opening the incubator in the lower level, and I have this desire to literally be the one to buy the furniture and to pick the furniture and and to pick out the laser cutters and the, you know, the the 3D printers and the 3D scanners and all of that and the whiteboards and um, and I have to back off because I, I there's so many great people in the library that can do this. And the only way that this project is going to be successful is if we involve more people within the library or really across the campus. So we now have faculty, a faculty advisory group, and we have a librarian on the faculty, and this faculty from, from engineering science, blah, blah, blah. Um, you just have to re remember as a leader that your responsibility is to help people be successful. It's not about you, and it's not about a reflection on you, it's a reflection on them. It's you helping them be successful, and you gotta remember what it is that you do that helps them to be respect or successful. And for me, most of the time it's about cutting through red tape. So we have an we're an institution where getting something fixed or installed or built is very, very challenging. And everybody on campus is trying to build something and everyone on campus is trying to fix something. And, and we only have so many people in our facilities department and so many people in our purchasing department. And there, you know, so where do we, how do we get this project elevated? That's my responsibility, is helping my people not get stalled in their creative process and their, um, the work that they're trying to do. So I'm here, it's not glamorous, it really isn't. <laughs> I'm here to make sure that everything goes well and goes smoothly when, others are not able to do it because they need a dean to step in. So it's, it's hard. You want to take on more. You want to be more involved. You're, you're really, you get really excited about a project. You want to see it through from start to finish, but you got to trust people. And that's what helps with not taking on too much is remembering what your role is and what your responsibility is. And really you need to be looking to the future. What's the next big project that you can help get started and then allow others to um, to work on. And, and most of the time, those great ideas are right here within your own library or your own institution. So you don't have to look outside of your institution because people within your institution, we have 90 people, they have great ideas every day. And so it's listening, it's taking the time to do that and then helping them be successful, but not trying to do it all yourself. That's that's a hard thing. I, w I want to have more time to do research. I want more time to do writing. And I, I don't allow myself that time so I do take on too much all the time but I think being being willing to delegate and being willing to um, trust those who work for you and work with you um, is really important it's a great great point that's um, it's easy to forget when you get caught up in a big detailed project like that for sure yeah. do we have any other questions from the floor Uh, while people are thinking about that, we maybe have time for one more from the floor. Uh, just very quickly, Tracy, uh, you talked about your PTA experiences. Um, <laughs> somewhat, uh, you know, the, amusingly, that it, it may have been one of your greatest leadership challenges, maybe not, but certainly challenging. Uh, and uh, just wondering if there are, if there's anything you want to say about challenges that you face, uh, you know, either on a day-to-day -day basis in your role or, uh, you know, as a kind of overview concept of being a leader. I think that I think that last question is probably for me my biggest challenge. It, it is trying to find that balance and making sure that you understand that you're a leader and not a manager and that you 
where what is your role and where can where can you as a leader be most influential and most successful and always remembering that and not putting yourselves not doing the work of others who are probably even better at it than you are like um we have an opportunity at our academic senate to start talking about open access because our university library board has um passed a resolution that they're now passing on to the academic senate to talk about open access and what that means here at san jose state it's very thrilling it's so exciting but i'm not the expert on open access i can be i'm on the senate so i have to be at the meeting anyway but i have people here who it's they're passionate about it they know so much more about it. They understand the, uh, the challenges, the implications. And so allowing them to speak to the Academic Senate and be the ones to answer the questions, to me, makes me more successful. So I have to allow them to do that. It's, it's the best thing for the university. It's the best thing for the library. And it's the best thing for them because they need that opportunity to to take on that leadership role and to take on that responsibility and and to be to get the credit for being the expert in that area. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, not just, uh, you know, um, insightful words that you have to leave us with, but uh, ins inspirational as well, too. You're right that we have a role to take on uh, across the library, any organization, any uh, information organization as leaders uh, and um, and doing and enacting those traits of leadership every day. So um, we are going to wrap up. I see a few people needed to get going and we always try <laughs> to be prompt and finishing on time. And so I really want to thank you, uh, Dr. Elliot. Um, I want to also invite uh, Dr. Allman to have any closing words. Uh, and as well, you, Tracy, if there's anything that you need to add before we uh, sign off for our afternoon. Well, thank I you for inviting me. It's been an honor. Well, thank you, Tracy. Um, we really appreciated having you here. Learned so much, and the comments that are coming in the chat um, are ranging from uh, inspirational to uh, even more uh, appreciative of your work. So, thank you so very much, and thank you to all our participants who are who are here today. And remember, we have two more uh, webinars, so we hope you'll join them for with us. Thank you.